What do you get when you mix influenza with an Italian plumber? You get Super Mario Land 2. Super Mario... Oh. No, no, we're not talking about that guy. We're talking about this guy, obviously. Before Mario was this, he was this. Yeah, this dude was big in the 80s. Deal with it. With each and every Mario game made and the success that followed it, it was obvious that this guy wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. He was plastered on merchandise, advertisements, cameos. He was Nintendo's mascot, which meant wherever Nintendo went, Mario would follow. Even into the puke green abyss they called the Game Boy. The 1989 Game Boy, a small rectangular block typically made of fire or sun dried clay. Wait a minute! Nintendo's handheld brick was truly a revolutionary device, bridging the gap between portable LCD entertainment and home console experiences of the 80s and 90s. Yes, it may be dated in some aspects, a lot of aspects, all aspects, but you can't deny just how iconic this system is. It paved the way forward for portable gaming, even if it did have one of the worst screen displays money can buy. But Nintendo already monopolized the gaming industry at that point. All they needed to do was put the right games on the system, or should I say, the right faces. Mario had already proven his influence before the Game Boy even launched, with three mainline games and many different spin-offs under his belt. It would be an understatement saying Nintendo would be the stupidest company if they didn't put this plumber on their handheld system. So, of course, they did, and not just once, but thrice. <laughs> Ah yes, the Super Mario Land Trilogy, the main Mario presence on the Game Boy. Now, whenever these games are mentioned, they're always deemed as underrated. Yeah, uh, underrated, but really, I think I see them more as overlooked. Literally no one talks about these games, and yet they were incredibly popular way back when. And I think part of the reason for that is honestly because of the hardware they were put on. Yes, the Game Boy was insanely popular, but come on, no one wants to suffer through all of this again. For most, it's either you bought them on Virtual Console, or never touched them again, or ever for that matter. Even I myself fall into this mindset from time to time. Occasionally I'll ask myself, would I rather play Super Mario Land or eat sushi and bubbler? Well, uh... <sighs> what, I at least thought about it. It's about time I stop picking sushi over this series and really see if they're worth anyone's time. Starting with, of course, the Game Boy launch title, Super Mario Land. Okay, now time to show you what I'm really playing on. So before you even boot up the game, Super Mario Land sets the tone straight away. The title clearly states that this is simply just a land, not a world. It's bite-sized in all categories. Sprites, playtime, the game itself. Four of these boy cartridges are equivalent to one manly cartridge, because the NES is it's manly. <laughs> of course, with it being on a handheld, limitations were expected. The game is only about 30 minutes long, but man, it's a charming 30 minutes. That time isn't spent in the Mushroom Kingdom either. Rather, you're in Sarasa Land. Sounds like a world that belongs on my eggs. Princess Daisy of the Land gets kidnapped by the evil alien Tatanga, and for some reason, Mario is here to save the day? Because I guess his LinkedIn profile got leaked to other kingdoms or something? I, I don't know. Now, one quick thing I'll point out here is just how well this brand new world is portrayed. The music is just purely fun. It's upbeat, it's amazing, and even with the game's limitations, they did a great job making each world distinct and different, all with new inhabitants and settings. And talk about a unique cast of creatures, my goodness. Never have I seen Easter Island heads pose a threat to Mario's life, and I'm all for it. It's nice to see that they wanted to differentiate themselves from the console titles. Even back then, it wasn't anything surprising seeing Mario off in a whole new world, but seeing this in the present day where 2D Mario feels so oversaturated with the same themes, I can't help but say that this just makes me smile. But even with all these changes, they still managed to keep the familiarity of past games while also mixing in its own quirky ideas and characteristics. Instead of castles, there's old Egyptian ruins. Koopa shells now explode after impact, power-ups completely launch out of item boxes, and instead of fire flowers, you find super flowers, which let you shoot bouncy balls to zoom all across the screen. The way it presents itself is definitely its biggest strong suit, but gameplay-wise, for being Mario's first portable, I mean, it's all right.
Super Mario Land 2. Okay, oh, hold on, jeez. I will say it feels pretty primitive nowadays. Momentum isn't really dealt well here, and the gravity drops you like a bag of bricks. However, after playing for a bit, oddly enough, I kind of got used to it. It's definitely functional, I'll give it that. Surprisingly though, gameplay switches up for a couple of levels with random auto-scrolling shooter sections. These kind of just come out of nowhere with no warning. They're very simple in gameplay, but they're a nice change of pace. Just another thing to add to the list of charm this game presents. It's obvious that Super Mario Land wasn't really made with the uh, same formula as previous entries. Uh, when you start to hear the Can-Can theme playing instead of the typical Mario Star theme, you kind of get the vibe that development was under new management, which is far from a bad thing. Mario's creator, Shigeru Miyamoto, had bigger fish to fry at the time, and so Nintendo opted to give the Game Boy's inventor, Gunpei Yokoi, the opportunity to direct and produce not only Super Mario Land, but also the rest of the following games in the series. Uh, you may recognize him from this picture, because literally everyone uses this picture. <laughs> Super Mario Land was surprisingly a nice little gust of fresh air. If you can get past the primitive platforming feel, I think it's worth looking back and checking out this overlooked world. Again, it's a tiny game, but in my opinion, that kind of just makes it more replayable and appealing to me. The music, world, and characters really makes this one stand out among the rest of Mario's platformers, and is a really charming tiny little title for the Game Boy. Will I be coming back to this game on a regular basis? No, I, I, don't, I don't plan on it. Could I see myself booting this up casually on a warm summer's evening? Oh yeah, oh yeah, 100%. Three years later, in 1992, Super Mario Land 2 Six Golden Coins was put on store shelves. And this game makes it quite apparent that this development team was not out of ideas. You see, Super Mario Land lived up to its name, okay? It was tiny. Super Mario Land 2, on the other hand, yeah, that's a different story. I mean, looking at the two side by side, these just look like they're on different consoles. Super Mario Land 1 to 2 is like a dub soap bar to a Dr. Squatch bar, okay? It's an upgrade on all aspects. Bigger and better graphics, fluent controls, four times the length. Now this is a sequel. I actually had the privilege of finding this gem on the 3DS eShop. It was a Mario game I had never seen or even heard of before. I bought it, beat it, and look at me now. You, uh, see a difference? Yeah, because there isn't one. Wario makes his grand debut, being Mario's antagonist this time around. Apparently, while Mario is in Sarasaland during the first game, Wario decides to invade Mario's private island and completely raids and takes over his personal castle. Well, I guess we all know where Mario's royalties went. Just like the first game, the overall theming is mixed up a lot compared to the conventional formula of past Mario's, only this time, they take it to a whole new level. Worlds are diversely detailed, with each zone having its own unique set of enemies, music, and final boss. And when I say diversely detailed, I mean they don't slouch with the variety. Like, this game is interesting, it's weird. When you have one of the main bosses as the three little piggies from the classic children's story, uh, you know you're in for a wild ride. I love that it leans into the wackiness though. It makes the game so memorable for me. And they had to do something to compensate for the lack of color. So they went out of their way to make every single world that much more different from each other. You have one zone where it's Halloween themed and there's Goombas with Jason masks on them. There's a world where you get swallowed by a giant turtle and inside it is a giant whale. One zone has you shrunk down to a tiny little dude running around a ginormous house. Oh, and there's this whole Mario zone where there's toy-like gimmicks, including this one themed after lots of circular objects and bouncy balls, and I'll have you guess where uh, that one's located. And what makes these worlds even cooler is you can experience them in whichever order you want. The game starts you off in a tutorial level of some sorts, and from there, you gain full freedom. If I had to find one nitpick about this game, it's that it's a bit too easy for my taste. Each boss is a breeze to get through, and because it is on a handheld, they opted to make enemies and platforms a lot more chunkier and easier to jump on, which I think overall helps the experience rather than hinder it. They also introduced this new carrot power-up that basically lets you hover in the air, but because of how fast your momentum takes you when using it, you can bypass certain 
sections like it's nothing. Again, the difficulty is really just a tiny nitpick. It's nothing that hurts the game as a whole. I'm just saying if you're looking for something to uh, test your skills instead of a casual playthrough, the closest thing you'll get to that would literally be the final level of the game. It's kind of hard to find anything more to say about this sequel. In a few ways, this game was pretty influential to the Mario franchise, and especially the Wario franchise, because without it, we wouldn't have WarioWare DIY. And where would I be without WarioWare DIY? Personally, I feel like Super Mario Land 2 needs more recognition. I can't understate how much of a substantial step Mario Land 2 is to 1. I'm serious when I say everything is upgraded. The game is definitely an interesting experience that will keep you entertained the whole time, and it's more than functional when it comes to being a quality platformer. If you haven't tried this game out for yourself, you're missing out on one of the Game Boy's most essential titles. As I saw the credits roll and the night got deathly quiet and my face lost all its expression, I said to myself, if you're gonna play the game, boy, you gotta learn to play it right. Are you quoting Kenny Rogers? No. Wario Land Super Mario Land 3. I'm not having a stroke when I say this, it's literally the title of the game. Yeah, this is one of those situations where they subtitle the game as a sequel, fearing it wouldn't sell well. But just like how people don't really consider Yoshi's Island a sequel or a prequel to Mario World, the same can be said about this game, even though it technically is. It's literally having an identity crisis though, cause it is the third Mario Land game, but it also is the first title of a whole new series of Wario Land games. So, I mean, in a sense, it's kinda pick your poison. And the poison I'm picking is this game representing the third and final installment of the Super Mario Land series released in 1994. Now, Super Mario Land 3 is different. It is a platformer, only Mario isn't the star of the show. Surprisingly, Wario gets the grand spotlight after debuting as a brand new character slash villain just a couple of years prior. I absolutely love this concept. I've always enjoyed playing as different characters or even enemies for that matter. And the fact that they went down that route of playing as the villain was incredibly unique for the Mario universe. The whole game's message has shifted from a typical heroic standpoint to an outright greedy villain only thinking for himself self, which is such an enjoyable contrast. Following the events of Mario Land 2, Wario hears rumors of a giant golden peach statue that was stolen by a gang of pirates. So he sets off to their home base, Kitchen Island, not to return Peach's statue, but instead to take it and sell it with the intentions of buying a castle of his own, Mr. Greedy Little Two-Shoes over here. The story also translates into the gameplay, where the goal isn't really finishing levels or saving a princess, but it's more about exploring each level, finding hidden treasure, and collecting as many coins as you can throughout the adventure. With this gameplay shift, the pacing is a lot slower. I mean, yeah, Wario is a lot more chunkier physically, but I don't think that's solely the reason why it's easygoing. The game wants you to slow down. Collecting is the main focus after all. The concept of Wario Land is great. I think having the focus be on collecting is a nice change of pace. Now, if only the literal pacing of the game wasn't as sluggish, I think I would enjoy this one a bit more. Uh, again, I like the concept, but personally, I'm more of a fan of the quicker, snappier gameplay of Mario Land 2, and Wario Land is far from snappy. First of all, you can really feel the weight of Wario in the platforming. He's slow and doesn't really have much forward momentum. They try to combat this by giving him a shoulder bash attack, which is nice for killing enemies, but mixing it in with platforming can feel pretty janky and I died a few times because of it. Enemies themselves also work a little differently. Most if not all of them aren't one hit KOs, but instead require to throw or to charge into them to finish them off, but this is a very small nitpick, it's not the biggest deal. I guess what I'm trying to say is that 
Wario Land doesn't feel as smooth overall as the previous games. And for being a game that tries to incorporate a little exploration, I found that some levels were kind of frustrating at times. What I mean by that is it was sometimes hard to differentiate hazards versus places I could explore. A few times I died to a pit or a hazard that I thought I could explore, but instead I just fell to my death. This could just be a personal problem, maybe having too high expectations when it comes to exploring, but I think this problem mainly stems from the Game Boy's limitations and the lack of color. I thought they could have done a better job at indicating hidden areas or places you could find. It also doesn't help that some level themes and enemies were, I felt, reused too often and got pretty redundant near the end of the game. I will say though, for being on the Game Boy, this game has a pretty good chunk of playtime. You have 40 levels to play, and hidden throughout the world are 15 relics that are super satisfying to stumble upon. On top of the relics you find, the game keeps track of your total coin count. At the end of each level, you get a choice of spending the coins you collected for extra lives, or playing a gambling game of double or nothing. And I know what you're thinking, Nintendo promoting gambling to kids? <laughs> well, it uh wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> Luigi. When it's all said and done and you defeat the final boss, the game tallies up all your money and based on how much you collected determines what kind of castle you end up with leading to multiple different endings. I ended up with a tree stump. Uh, you can really tell I tried my best. <laughs> Wario Land Super Mario Land 3 brings up an interesting take for me personally. I didn't really enjoy Wario Land as much as I was hoping, but I do think it's a good Game Boy game. I think it boils down to the slower gameplay. I felt it was a little too sluggish and slow for my liking, but I do think it was intentionally designed to favor a better portable experience. When you have faster gameplay and precision on a smaller handheld, it can bring up some problems, but with this game being slower and having the goal revolve around collecting, I just think it fits the portable atmosphere better. It also encourages replayability and exploration which other Mario platformers at the time did not. It's a big Game Boy game that has lots of cool features for its time, like cutscenes and multiple endings, and thinking back to when this came out during its time period, I think it would be a solid title. But right now, I just feel as though it wasn't the game for me personally. One thing I will say about Wario Land though, is that it's different. And I can appreciate that. I may have not enjoyed it as much as others, but if this brought any interest to you, I would say give it a shot. It's not my favorite, but it's definitely a quality Game Boy title. But back in 1994, it must have done well enough because Wario Land didn't just get a sequel, but it paved the way forward and created a brand new beloved line of games of its own, expanding the Wario world even further and solidifying himself as a staple character in Nintendo's library. But all of that is for another day down the line. <laughs> the Super Mario Land series is really underappreciated in my eyes. I think all three were good games that brought quality platforming experiences to Nintendo's 90s handheld. They may be a bit dated in some aspects, and yeah, Wario Land may have not been my cup of tea personally, but for the most part, I enjoyed this series, and I think all three are very charming, and I really do think they brought a lot of value to this brick they called the Game Boy. Thanks for watching and listening, and uh, I'll probably Catch you later, and uh, but let me just unzip this for you. For you, there we go. <laughs> Thanks for watching.